we're a very young university program. Peter Lang, um, I'm currently at the uh, University of Health Science and Pharmacy in St. Louis, Missouri. College all over the world and comes to college here in uh, oh, the uh, Thanks, Eddie Abel. Uh, I am the interim head coach at IU, and as I've told everybody all weekend, God willing, that will not be my job as soon as possible. Uh, but I've uh, been there for a couple months, taking over at a student tour, I believe, by the whole time. I'm Corey Momsen. I'm the head rugby coach at the University of Rio Grande, first year program. Um, yeah, uh, both men's and women's rugby. And I'm Brent Nelson. I'm the head coach at Iowa Central Community College. Um, we're located in Fort Dodge, Iowa. And we've been around uh, about five or six years, or about six or seven years, I guess. Um, yeah. I'm John Harley. I'm the head coach at Marion University. We're uh, located in Indianapolis, Indiana. Varsity program. We're going into our second year. I'm Sean Littersmith. Everybody calls me Stacks. I'm the head coach of the University of Minnesota. We've been around for a while. I'm Mason Mason. Mason. He's my assistant coach. Good <laughs> boy. He knows more than me. Who are all of you? Alex, uh, I'm Alex Goff. I'm an editor of Goff Rugby Report. So I'm here to learn something. The experts here. I feel it with questions. I don't know what he was asking. Alex, maybe I was looking for your green Yeah, I think if um, folks have questions that they would like to put their hand up and we can sort of collectively answer, um, or if Alex has got some questions you're welcome to ask. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Like, yeah, black hat. Uh, two for the the newer programs. Uh, what were the biggest challenges you faced so far? Just uh, having some credibility in your program. So just like a lot of times, if you're established, you've been around for a while, you can say this is our list of alumni. But for newer programs, you know, how do you guarantee your your recruits, your new players that? and this program works. So usually you want an experienced coach that's been in other programs. I had to say, you know, this was my path as a player, and these are my dreams, these are my aspirations for this program. And this is what I'm gonna do for you guys, you know, day in, day out. Yeah, I'd agree with that. You know, starting off a new program, initially you got to marketing and selling yourself, really. And, and I'll add to that, that pretty much all of us were starting varsity programs are at schools that you probably haven't heard of if you're not from the town that we're in. Um, and so, you know, we're not like a University of Minnesota or an Indiana University that's ubiquitous that everyone knows in the region. So it's not just selling ourselves as coaches, but also why is there value in this institution over a school that you've heard of your whole life? So yeah, it is a lot of marketing that we do. What about Marriott? Uh, I'd say the biggest, the biggest hurdle was um, coaches, players, contact info. That was the biggest one. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so when it comes to uh, recruiting, uh, you know, we're we're a university trying to bring in more American players uh, to compete at the in the in the, the mid south. Um, when you have four year players for for you guys. Uh, that fourth year player that might want to go to a master's program, uh, are you trying to actively keep those guys around or are you saying explore your options? Because right now, I think our best option is to bring American players in that are ready right away to play D1A. Uh, it is probably guys that are been in a program like Minnesota or Marion that have been there four years. I've uh, got a lot of experience that so we can trust them right away. What are your thoughts on like, sending players like that away or? or having them explore their options, I guess. I'll let you know in three years. <laughs> uh, in terms of, of getting a student in, in their position in their grad school time or going to a PhD or something, we actually experienced that. And I would say, AJ, who's, who's now my associate head coach, he was a great player, but we only, we only got him for a year, right? And so I think a grad student or a person going into that position it's good to have around for one year as a player, but you need continuity in the program. So 
get them thinking about what they'll do once their eligibility is up. And I'm thankful that AJ uh, Zobodakis, our coach, who had played at Notre Dame prior, uh, was willing to learn how to be a coach. And, and in the early days when I came on as a head coach, it was just myself. And then AJ finished playing, and then it was AJ, and then we found our, our mental skills coach. So having AJ there to start helping build our coaching staff was amazing. I think grad students are a great way to do that. I mean, many of them are in programs that are being paid for anyways. So lean on them, you know, lean on their experience to do that. Okay, I, I think it's kind of just a second after your question. You have to kind of look out what's best for that player. Uh, I would never pressure a kid to stay a fifth year of college if it wasn't going to be the best thing for him, just so guy had that guy for one more year. Um, as someone running programs, if he's leaving, it's my job to make sure there's a capable replacement when he's gone. It's not my job to keep him in Bloomington for as long as possible because we're not vampires. We're, we're there to move these kids on. The bulk of the kids that every coach up here coaches are never going to be equals. That's just reality. Uh, most of them aren't even going to be full-time paid professionals. They're going to be professional in something else. And so job one doesn't need to be make them better rugby players. Job one needs to be make sure they're prepared when they leave and leaving at the right time and the rugby set. So I would look at it. If, if it's legitimately in the kid's best interest and it's what the kid wants to do, then yeah, absolutely. Keep for that extra year and take advantage of it. But if they have a professional opportunity somewhere else, it's a good opportunity. They, they need to go get that because their life's not going to be college. Their life's going to be what comes after college. Um, yeah, I like to tell guys like, if, if the best thing you ever do in life is play rugby in college, you fail in life. Right? That playing in college might be the funnest thing you do in life, but it shouldn't be the best thing you do. In life. Um, it should be something else, and you should be excited to leave taking the experiences with you and go make your mark on the world somewhere else because that's what the bulk of these guys are going to do. They're going to make their mark outside of Rome. I agree wholeheartedly with all that. I think graduating is job one. Getting the ready is definitely job one. Part of our job as coaches is, is not to win the game, it's to have them fall in love with rugby enough that when they go on to those professional things, they remember their program, they remember those formative years when they start giving back either as coaches or supporters or alumni or how do we do that? Donate. 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 But before they do that, there's still another step in there that we need to be mindful of. We need to be able to, as coaches, and suddenly something I'm working on is finding the next top step, the next step in their journey in rugby. Um, I think that is partly our responsibility to continue there. Uh, love of the game, uh, playing the game, whether it's at a D3 level or a D1 level, or if they're good enough to, to have a look at an academy level that's associated with an MLR, whatever their level suits, uh, we should be able to find them out as well. It's good, thank you. Uh, building on that, uh, do you have uh, Relationships with senior clubs. Yes, in terms of and, and do you nurture that? how do you nurture that uh, to give them the next step that might be professional, but also professional a job, but also you know, the next step. Part. So I'll, I'll say from the women's side, um, I work incredibly hard, just like it sounds like everyone up there does, to make my athletes aware of rugby that is available to them after graduation. And of course, all of the club options are available, but there's also many other paths that are not playing. And so making them aware of coaching opportunities, administrative opportunities, refereeing opportunities, um, wherever they are geographically. Because um, the reality of the women's game is it's very unlikely they're gonna make any money, right? At all. Um, and my own personal background is, is in the WPL. So I spent six years competing uh, the WPL women's career league, the top 10 women's program in the country. Um, and I've had many athletes go on and compete for various WPL teams. Um, in addition to that, going on to play in the career ship where I also played um, over in England, which is now a huge trend um, after going over to play in the UK. But, you know, it's not just those high level programs. Regionally, um, you know, working to make sure that they're connected to, you know, the youth rugby organization or the referee society or um, a mentor who can help them become a great administrator, you know, whatever it is. Um, I think that beyond just their ability as a player is also important for us. So 
I'll take that on a little bit as well. Um, so, aside from being the head coach at UHSP, I'm the director of rugby at uh, Central Park. Um, and I did that delivery when I came in. And what I found there is that uh, all the, the local clubs you have, whatever level they are, they're desperate to form relationships with universities because they want to see that happen. That's a great feeling for them. So, you just reach out to your local clubs there as coaches. They will they'll fall all over you to, to help out with whatever they can. And it's a great resource for you. And it's, as you say, a great resource for your players and find the problems. Have really have. A big part of it too is, yes, it's on us to help find these guys' homes. Uh, but one thing I've noticed is, especially with MLR, a lot of MLR teams will reach out to coaches about specific players. And they've seen the film. And, and they almost know your players as well as you do, especially the older guys, because they'll, they'll be, you know, they have a draft now, and they don't want to screw up in the draft. They, they, they don't want to look like the hits. They're just like, we don't want to look like the hits. And so they do their own. I had two calls this week with MLR GMs about players in my program, where you know they're asking, what is their status? Would they want to get drafted? Would they move here? Would they do these things? And, and these are all things that you don't necessarily consider it part of your job as the college coach, but more and more as the men's club game professionalizes, it's it's going to start to factor in where you're going to have to start looking at, like, well, no, this guy's not going to move to Atlanta, so don't draft him because he's just not going to go there. Um, and, and stuff like that that 10 years ago you would have never thought about is now starting to kind of come to the picture. So I would say yes, just from the perspective of, I think rugby as a sport has struggled to assimilate what we consider stereotypical American sports culture. Every other major American sport is going to have a draft. And so if I say, hey, it's the, it's the draft. That's the lingo that everyone is going to understand, even if you don't, you don't, never see a rugby ball in your life, you're going to know what the draft is. And so I think it brings a level of publicity uh, that you're just not going to get. I will say I like everything about it. I think there can be improvements, but I think as a, as a general concept, I think it's a good idea. Does, does anybody here know how many players playing at law in the draft compared to Oh, it's going to be a small percentage. Yeah, they will have draft two or three right. years, I think. So, so, so it's quite small. Obviously, it's going to grow all the time, but but just now, it's it's just one of the avenues in the NFL that we've not mentioned because it's like, I believe the draft is a great marketing tool. I understand and agree with you on that. But um, for the athletes in our programs, they need to know that it's not the only avenue into that that dream if they want to if they want to pursue that. And domestic rugby is not the only professional rugby option for me to do that, you know. So, connections internationally, you know, so I, I've come to the, for a long time in Europe where, you know, the professionalism there, you can get paid, and the, the level can go quite low. So, Belgium, for example, has a professional league for you, you can play rugby. But, um, but you can go there as a, a relatively mediocre player. I make money for actual dream. Um, so, you know, there are lots of different ways that you can make money playing rugby, as you said, to be through, uh, through other avenues like rugby and things like that. I think the draft just gets more student, more players into the game. So, especially high school, like hopefully kids hear about it at an early age where they join a high school club. Then we're recruiting kids that have two, three years experience. Uh, it keeps I think it keeps collegiate players kind of returning every year too. That I'm going to work hard to go to them to get drafted. So I think it's a good way to just get more players into the game so they can see a future in them. Great question. Here's a question for you guys. So I'm Brian Bevel. I'm the head coach at Dream Men's Rugby, brand new program. So you see us all popping up. What do we need to do with brand new programs to communicate and be accepted and get a seat at the table with the current 
teams and universities that are out there. I know scheduling is one thing, but I mean sharing ideas, getting, you know, getting knowledge as to more players. You can't have them all. So to share the players and give them that education, what do you need from us as brand new programs to communicate to you? I would say, I mean, communicating with other collegiate programs. I mean, I, I would say always start locally and building the best relationships possible with, you know, referee society or whatever union you're a part of. I mean, it very much depends on the region of the country, how much rugby is in your area differs, right? But I would say first always starting locally because that is where your reputation is going to grow and develop and building really good relationships with the teams in your area so that they think of you as this is where the quality rugby is, this is where the high quality rugby is, this is where the professional experience is going to be. So you can that program to then build up. Um, and depending on that point, that's right when you can meet some other folks. That's my first thought. Well, I think, I think like this um, was great. I mean, a lot of us didn't know each other existed until we set up next to each other, you know, and I've been playing rugby for 35 years out of Springfield, Missouri. So coming to Wisconsin and meeting all these new people is just a, I mean, it's, it's been brilliant for me to make the connections. But I think just, if I make a phone call and ask a question of another coach, I don't, I want to make sure that, you know, they know that I've been a referee for 17 years, so I know the referees, I've got that part. i got the local now. Now I'm looking to get my program out there more regional, even further than that. I'll say this, especially for everybody on this panel, you just bring us back, we'll chat. Yeah. We, we all either know each other or know people who know one another. We've all linked out on certain levels. You know, I, we just recently started setting up sevens with I was at Bill Perry. You know, I think Corey's probably the only person I've really connected with. But we still know a little bit, know where he's at. And, you know, just have that courage just to jump off the cliff and say, hey, Snacks, how's it going? Hey, Laura, what are you doing now? I have an email sitting in my inbox with someone trying to start a rugby program at a school, right? And I'm going to email them back, and we're going to get on the phone, and we're going to chat about it. Like, we all want rugby programs. Well, I spoke, yeah. I spoke about it in Central the other day. We had yeah. a 30 minute conversation. Right. It was fantastic. So I just want to incubate that and make, you know, be able to reach out. I yeah. think we don't all know each other. Right. I, mean, I, I think, I mean, yeah, it's three other, hours from me. Yeah. The other part of that is, uh, what I'm finding is the more we connect with each other and, and understand each other's programs better, we know, like, so if I get a kid who's really not super, my, my school's very specialized in health sciences, so, you know, if, if I come across a kid who locally is, like, really good and uh, wants to go to college rugby, but, like, the only one doing health sciences, well, now I've got, I've got a whole load of connections where I can be like, okay, go talk to Corey, or go, go you know, this, this, this rugby, go talk to Laura, so that's really important as well, obviously. You know, like that way. So, I would even point out, like, John and I are the same state, but he's at a smaller school in a big city, and there are certain kinds of kids that's going to appeal to them, and they're going to want to go there, and they're not going to want to go 40 miles south of the Bloomington with a 35,000 person campus. And if I, you know, if I'm trying to order players, and no, you should all come here, don't go there, and they're all going to leave. They're not going to like it, and they're either going to quit or they're just going to transfer there anyways. And you know, kind of building on this, it's, it's you're targeting kids who want to be part of your program, and it, it's really a small circle. There, there, there are not. It's not terrible to say. There's not a lot of public college programs in the country uh, relative to the number of colleges that are in the country. Uh, I, I, Part of that, there's there's not necessarily the infrastructure there, the support system, you know, the stereotypes from universities. Um, a lot of schools are in systems where you know it's under the right sports banner, and they have no incentive to make the rugby program better, so nobody takes that on. Um, or there's just nobody in the area who knows how to coach rugby, so you know they coach themselves. And so when you're talking about programs that are at events like this, are, are well run, it, it's a it's it's really a limited number, and because of that, we all kind of recognize. If there's somebody out there who wants to be in that group, you're going to encourage them, you're going to help, and you're, you're going to be there because the bigger that group gets, the better it is for everybody, right? I tie myself both. Got to do If you need a contact list, I can just talk to you guys that have thrown in. Yeah. <laughs> Alex knows everybody. I <laughs> no, appreciate that, thank you.
to see what's going on. Uh, okay, so um, the the landscape for uh, college is very confusing, uh, or so I say. Uh, and, and maybe some high school students think that. Um, or is it? Is it? Is it as confusing as it appears to someone? Uh, observing yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. yes. Yeah. Right. It, it is Probably a more. mind full time <laughs> job to know, with all of our jobs, to know this stuff. And it's confusing to me. I still don't know it. <laughs> right. So, yes. So, we, we have uh, USA Rugby slash ACR. We have D1A. We have MCR. MCR. Small College. We have MCR Division 2. No answer to our brand, and then uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's all right. Yeah. Right. And then, uh, yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll <laughs> your figure that. We're gonna probably start in NCR. Yeah, probably start in NCR. There's all this talk um, about even whether you can play each other, which probably is so much talk and nothing else. Um, how, how do you navigate that? Um, how do you navigate that for a, a kid coming to play? Or even with your administration, try to explain. Making it as simple as possible is very hard, right? But you want to be able to, like, for example, I coached at a Naira D2 school. I coached men's and women's programs um, at a school all at Stratus University. My women's team was Naira D2. Simple. We play other D2 teams. In the in the NCAA, here's a list of them. That's what we play. Very simple. The, the, so the guys, um, eventually, we were able to join uh, the Allegheny Rugby Union and play five other colleges within our conference, and we could move on from there, right? It was very simple. So on the local level, again, you know, it, it could make some sense, but when you're in the recruiting process, that's when it sort of opens up to all of these options, and as a high school athlete, you might say, well, I can go to NCAA, or I can go to one of these schools that are D1 elite, or I can go to a varsity program that's not D1 elite, but like, maybe they're going to get there in the next couple of years. So I think it's, it's when it's opened up to this large picture where it gets really confusing. think of it from looking at the individual program and say, well, who are they? They're not ready to. Okay, I know they live in schools, right? But that is her complaint of family. And I think it comes down to university too. Being honest, I don't really deal with it. And it Snacks is probably a similar boat. Like the players coming to IU or coming to IU come to IU. They're not coming to IU to play D1 A rugby. Uh, they're there for the university. I think maybe at the smaller schools where it's their scholarships and stuff like that, it might factor a little more. Um, but you know, they're coming for the degree and brand more so than they are. Like I want to compete at the highest level. It's it's more. I want to go to that school, and it's a bonus that the rugby program is good. But it's at best the second most important thing to list. So. I've been recruiting all year. I had a single player ask me, like, what division you play? Because, you know, and that part is we play in the Big Ten. If I say Big Ten, everybody here is going to know what the Big Ten is, right? And they're going to know we go play Purdue. They know we go play Ohio State. Um, so I don't necessarily deal with it as much there, but I, I definitely see how it could be an issue for schools that you kind of mentioned earlier, right? Where if you're a smaller school and a newer program, and people are like, you know, if I have to tell, are, you know, if I was going to the athletic department at IU, and I said, hey, we gotta go play Lindenwood this weekend, the first question I would get is, who the hell is Lindenwood? And everybody in rugby knows who, yeah, yeah. And everybody in rugby knows who Lindenwood is, and where it is, and what it is, but that's, you've done that the brand, but if I'm like, we're going to play Purdue, they're gonna assume that's a tougher game than going to play Lindenwood, when it is absolutely nowhere near here, the same thing. But one of the things I'm wondering is, for those um, high schoolers coming into the college level who really want to play at that top level, they're already going to understand what you're talking about and they're going to know that because they're in there. And the ones who don't are probably not going to care about it that much. What they are going to care about is, you know, is it a well run program? And am I going to have the ability to get to playoffs? There's probably lots of playoffs in the excitement that drink or something there. And are you aligned to some sort of national campus? They will ask those questions more than are you a D2, are you a small college, or are you a small You know, because it's, it, to a certain extent, it's about bragging rights. Oh, we won our conference, this is the 
one team we went to the national playoffs, we got national playoffs. But, you know, when I was at, uh, at another school that uh, won national playoffs, we didn't say that we won the two national playoffs. We just said we won national playoffs, you know, and that's that's how we were going to because that's the bragging on it. So I wonder how important it is for those kids who don't understand it. As a coach, I've experienced several league, division, uh, organizational changes as a coach. So what I try to do, especially in a new program, is tell recruits who we play. So like, you know, who we play in you know, the regular season, who we make it to postseason. So if we're looking at recruits, you know, if they're new to the game, they might not know, you know the divisions, the leagues, whatever. But I just try to explain who we play. If you play big schools, that sounds great to recruits. I, I apologize, but I was just kidding around. But you're you're in a unique situation in many ways, uh, but you have more freedom. Is that fair to say? Yeah, and, and, and honestly, I take no offense to that. You know why? Because we're the most unique program in the country, and I'm okay with that. Because you're going to talk about it as the most unique program in the country. I'm fine with that for right now. The only place that that really hurts us is. I got to work a lot harder at scheduling. But we play Lindenwood, Davenport, uh, Arkansas State. Uh, you know, we play some of the top programs in the country. We're not afraid to punch up. We're going to tell a recruit, like, come here, be competitive, and go play. We also played Indiana last spring. Um, you know, and you know, it's actually like an experience, uh, you know, we also <laughs> played Minnesota as well. Um, and Mary. Yeah. So, you know, we're looking at, you know, getting, getting some good games against some good competition. Uh, I take no offense to that. We are unique, and, and that's okay because it comes back to what we talked about earlier, and that is providing uh, an opportunity for the kids that's different than what you know some of the other programs have to offer. And, you know, we're just that unique, I guess. Do, do people understand why you're unique? Perhaps some people might want to. Uh, I, I think pretty much everybody in this room maybe does, but. Um, okay. Uh, you know, being a community college and not having a conference, kind of being in the part of the country where there's not a lot of D1 varsity programs, where which we are NCR Division One, by the way. Um, you know, we're kind of you know kind of in the middle of nowhere, and so that's kind of why it becomes a little unique that we have to find and build relationships where we're willing to travel and other people are willing to travel. A lot of the programs, I don't mean to speak for them, but, um, you know, they recruit from us. So having that relationship is a positive thing. So I, I agree, it's a really positive thing. It was kind of a leading question to, to ask you, do you know of any other community colleges that are looking to follow that same one? Because I think it really, it really enriches it. If we have more community colleges, yeah. it's another source into collegiate rugby, you know, for our programs. Well, I'm a community college and university. Right. Yeah, so that really helps. I mean, you know, we kind of market that we're a university, but we don't really say too much that we're a community college. But students that are looking for that, that's that's what we do. Yeah, I would, I would maybe not do that for <laughs> until you get really, really established. But um, it does make it a little bit more difficult because there is that stigma that we talk about with oh. Uh, come to, you go to a community college, you can't go anywhere else because it's last chance you or something like that. I think that people that come to our campus and have been through our program, they understand it's not that at all. Um, you know, and so, uh, you know, I guess for me, it comes back to the, the opportunities that we provide for kids that just aren't looking for something separate. Um, you know, when I started the program at Iowa Central, there was a glaring need for trade programs um, for kids that didn't have that avenue. And so that was that was the main thing, but now it becomes, hey, there's kids that can get into any school in the country. They just want to play some really good rugby. Um, we put pretty good footy at Iowa Central, I think. And so um, we've got an uh, administration that is it, very, uh, very well supported. Um, and so we're very, very fortunate. So uh, I just count my blessings every day, but this is a very unique opportunity for us. I'll say this. Brent's doing cutting edge. 
how many times have you had rugby buddies back in your playing days and stand around the bar having a few drinks and everybody said, my God, community college is the way into four years, let's get this going. And now everybody's digging on Brent and his program. My God, these guys are tough, tough competitors. And they should be risen up and all those haters in the community. I mean, we hear them all the time in the Midwest. Like, that's bullshit. These are good kids, good coaches. You know, they're putting in a lot of time and effort and they're providing an opportunity. I would argue there are people, people selling their souls to be the head coach of a varsity program at junior college. And that is one of the ways forward in this country, right? And that's something I think we need to start changing our community is the way we talk about programs like Brent's or you know, what Corey could probably get now at the Ryle, right? That, that's bullshit. It's a college, it's a school. These kids are going there, getting an academic education, maybe transferring, maybe not. They're playing damn good rugby. Those are all the things that tick all the boxes for every varsity program or D1 program. That's horseshit. I I'm, I'm sorry. But no. I mean, it is what it is. We had a, a Wisconsin kid who was a high school All American that just is, is, will be graduating this spring with his diesel tech degree. Now, that kid's not playing in college without out of center, at, at least at the time. You know? And so uh, I am tickled to death to be able to provide that for that kid. And that's what it, it, I'm going to always go back on is. It's a unique opportunity for, for someone. So we all know as, as youth rugby people that there's a lack of referees in our communities. Uh, so my question to the panel is, what are you doing as a leader in the, in the college landscape to, to have your players become referees or give back through the referee community? So the first thing that we do, and a lot of programs already do this, is host referee courses within our program. They're on our campuses, um, and if possible, pay for a portion of or all of the, the fees that they have to do that. A lot of programs do that already, right? But encouraging it, you know, if we can, sponsor it from, you know, the correct direction to pay for the certification. The challenge, obviously, is when we get certified, we play on Saturdays. No one else plays on Saturdays. There's a scheduling issue for college students. Um, but not forgetting, you know, when they leave our program, that that is a very important pathway forward in rugby to be putting players on intentionally. Uh, I'll say this, or I, I can speak. I have a unique experience. I actually run rugby events for a living, right? And so I have opportunities to volunteer at certain events. And I realized this last summer at Custom Build 7 that certain individuals who could potentially be referees later on might be the kids I'm going to lean on to come volunteer at those events. We have a, a young man, or he's not at that young, Kevin Connors, who is at Quest for Gold, just happened to be doing his internship in LA. And I said, Kev, if you come out, hey, I'll get you a t shirt, you know, we'll get you running balls or doing something else. And I ended up putting him with the batch officials, and Mike Kelly and Nick Ricono and those guys, and he found his people. Right? They treated him really well. The referees in our world need to understand that if they want folks to come in, they might need to be a bit more inclusive and maybe adapt a little bit, right? And as coaches, we can identify those folks who might have a better personality suited to refereeing or suited to managing or suited to being a physio or, or whatnot. So, you know, I think we're all doing a great job of identifying folks for the different roles. And I think people still want to play a little bit and have fun too. So we've got to figure out how to do that all in one, which, which is different. But one, one of the other things I think is to support referees and their growth is, um, you know, we train, you know, some of us uh, train every day of the week, uh, some of the clubs train twice, twice a week. When do the referees train? They don't get an opportunity to train. So I invite them to come to our trainings on a regular basis so they can help on their skills. It's really important. Alumni networks are also great too. We're, we've reached out to ours and said, you know, if we want to grow a pool of referees to do B side games or a touch touch, I'll pay for your certification or whatever. Now, in our particular area, in Minnesota, we haven't had a referee or an AR course in quite a while. So we haven't had to really take opportunity for that. But it's out there. Right? I think we're, we're providing that. We haven't done this yet. Um, Dustin's even have a court. Oh, we haven't done this yet, but um, we also, you know, Encourage your players to get involved in refereeing, right? So there's a high school season, and they usually play on Wednesdays or Thursdays. 
they earn, I mean, Michigan, they correct they get $150 for a game. Might, might be a might be hard to find something like that. But I mean, it's a, I mean, it's a decent, it's a decent little price to, you know, to, to referee a game. And then your players get a little bit more knowledge of the game as well, right? Now they're involved in the game, they're calm in the game. Now they have, when they're out there, they're out in the field, they know a little bit more about it. So, it's a good option. Yeah, we, uh, just a month ago, Marion did a, of course, eight players did it. And the whole goal is, in Indiana, you throw these on Sundays. So, kids can go out, get paid to do it. You can get to see Marion players out there. That was great. I don't watch the TV. And it, it's, it's great for your top bell guys that don't miss the field. Sure. They get to actually learn. They have a few jets and all of their I'd like to make one comment about life after college and the pathways after college. I agree that we should be identifying people and not making them aware of opportunities, but to a coach up here, we're not responsible for actually growing the referee pool or growing a club or, or doing these sorts of things. Like, we make that connection and it's our responsibility to grow our programs. And we're seeing it like because we're big D1 programs or varsity programs or whatever and we're growing, and people think it's our responsibility to like spread that wealth through the entire community, but it's really difficult to do when we have to focus on so many kids and, and coaches and athletes in our programs. So I think us as coaches in, in a community, a broader community in this sense is, we can start making people aware like, hey, how can I help you grow? Who can I connect you with? But you've got to take that ball and run with it when it gets to a certain point, right? And, it, and I think, you know, Guy Hagen's here from, from MLR, and maybe he's got a huge job ahead of him, but like, it's not the MLR's responsibility to pump kids into programs. It's their responsibility to make people aware of it, those individual clubs, the referee societies, to that they bolster their ranks and, and be inclusive enough and have enough development or training to keep people coming back. I, I just think we should be changing the language a little bit to structure it that way so it doesn't feel so overwhelming. I'm sitting here going, oh my God, I've got to get guys to the NLR, I've got to get referees, I've got to you know, get a coaching. And I'm like, it's my job to coach myself, not coach everybody else too. Right? So, and I hope that doesn't sound harsh or mean, but like, if we all focus on our areas, everything around us will get better too because I'm seeing Brent do great stuff. I'm seeing Mary come up in Indiana, you know, Iowa are getting strong. I've got to get Minnesota strong. It's making me work harder in turn. Is that fair to say? Yeah, second for you. Uh, what started your train of thought? Uh, I don't know if those are your words with like New Zealand and stuff, but getting the buy in from students like that. What well, was my train of thought? Yeah, what what brought this on and how did how did this happen? Because traveling to stuff like this and, and I know from watching the games and stuff, you have a you have a team. And, and I'm just curious how you came about that and how you included more people in it. I'll let them answer. They 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 made that choice. What well, what was it for Bob's a former player, Nick's a current player, and Ryan's a student, sports management association. Uh, if you want to take it as a that one? I can speak to it. Um, for me, I was like going to college, I was just looking for community um, in some place where I could, you know, uh, like play sports and just have fun, but also be accepted and like make friends and build relationships. And my CA on my floor was, uh, I'm the rugby team, and you know, he was, his name's Elijah. Super nice to me. Uh, one of my best friends to this day, and like I, I really think it's all about like you did the culture session before, but it's just about being inclusive. Like everybody has anxiety about trying new things and you know uh, meeting new people, but if you know you got guys on your team who are asking kids questions, introducing themselves, being nice, friendly, whatever, it's gonna come. Like the program will follow um, if you're inclusive and, and accepting of everyone. Um, I got the, the program was in a much different state when I had come to the U of M. Um, you know, we had a very big disconnect between seniors and freshmen. We were traveling to games with 16 people. Um, and I think the part that really 
pulled me into the U of M was that opportunity to, to build something better and even better after me. And Snacks had come on coaching my junior year, and you know, we had sort of worked together to build you know, the, the culture that we use today. And so for me, it, it was much more about, you know, I want to leave this place better than I found it. I want to build something. I want, I want to be better at it. Yeah, so like Snacks said, um, it is culture presentation. Like when they first started building the team culture, there was only like 16, 20, there were 22 guys at the first team culture meeting. And once that culture started to be like implemented and spread by the guys on the team, that created like a new sense of buy-in that they started to spread to all of the players who came. Um, so that obviously helped to grow the program just by people seeing our culture um, on social media, building a bigger social media presence, um, as well as just building the coaching staff. Yeah, from the coach's perspective, it's about their, their environment, their experience, right? And so when I took over as head coach, no idea where we were going to go. I had no idea. And I, I was nervous, right? Much like public speaking, I had no fucking clue what to do. And I just see all these eyes looking at me. And I made them a promise on day one that it was always going to be about them, what they wanted to do, where they wanted to go, like even if that meant it was exploratory and we failed at an experiment or, or a route, like, so be it, we failed, but we'll learn something out of it. And through that, through that, the, the building of that like trust and camaraderie, we recognized we needed help with social media and marketing. We recognized we needed help with organization and logistics. So we brought Ryan and Hannah on. And in that, we just, what do we want to do? Well, let's, let's try this. Okay, shit, let's go. You know. Um, I'm a big believer in just like experiment, right? Yeah, we, we try it. Like, I'm just not afraid. Like, let's go jump off cliffs together. It's, it's fun, right? Because when it, when it lands, my God, it's awesome. When it doesn't land, we go, well, maybe we won't do that again, but we'll, we'll figure out another way to do it, right? It, it didn't come specifically from any one team or another. You know, maybe a life philosophy or learning from these players and, and coaches that, like, Taking risks is good, you know. And, and to, to their credit, they held up the mirror a lot of times, and I had to like own up to who I was and what I was about, and, and really buy in and do what, what they asked of me to do. You know, like Brian comes to me on a weekly basis. What do you think of this? And my feedback is, be wild, be crazy, go do it. I don't care. Let's do it. You know, if it hits, it hits. If it doesn't, well, let's, let's try something else. And then through that, it's just attracted other people. There's some other cool things that we have going on internally that I never thought would come out. Players from other sports, coaches, just showed up one day and were just standing there for three weeks on the sideline before I was like, wait, do you want to coach or something? And, and, you know, they were coaching. Spent two years in the program and now they're starting their own business. It's, a, it's just a little bit. We just track what we accept. Right? Like, I got to say this. I love how he answered the question. Didn't answer the question. <laughs> let, his, let his players answer the question. That speaks to the culture of what he's doing. Yeah, it's yeah. amazing. Yeah, I just want to. I want to commend you guys, all three. You. You're the future. Like, like he said it is. In his, in his culture speaks. Like, we're just the keepers, but you're the driver. It's what I'm saying. It's so good to see something like that happen. And I think it's it's a blueprint for the future because it's not happening. Now. Nothing. If your if your staff and players don't want to sit in the car for four and a half hours to go to Culver's with you, you might be doing something else. Yeah. <laughs> and Culver's is enough to get the car. <laughs> uh, and, and, and to their credit, all three of them, I, I put it out to the entire leadership group and the coaching staff and said, "Who wants to go?" And one or one player turned it down. A couple coaches turned it down. And I was prepared to bring all of them. Yeah. You know, like, we'll bring them. And they were, all three of them were like. Shit, yeah, let's go. And then we got the car, and they were like, what are we doing? <laughs> I said, you can go to presentations, you can sit at the table, you can help me film or do whatever, save me on my technology pieces. But yeah, they build it. I just kind of like hold on to the reins and we go. Um, we have about five minutes left. Or it makes it so far. 
Unless Alex wants to answer it. Um, there was, a, I think it was Lipper had uh, something earlier today. It was, uh, I think it was like a mantra or a quote or something. But I was, I'd be kind of interested to know, like, what's the best piece of advice each of you have ever been given in, in respect to either rugby or real life? So for me, and this pertains to rugby a little bit, um, uh, so I, I was involved in karate. And my karate instructor told me, uh, don't ever think you can't learn from a white belt which is the beginning of your karate development. Don't think you can't go and learn something from a first year coach or someone that, you know, some, like even a player, for example, might have an idea or something like that. That, that to me, like, is kind of a, a life mantra and um, keeps me humble a little bit. No, you I'm big on that. Failure isn't fatal, it's feedback. And it kind of builds on what Snacks was talking about, like try different things. Um, I had a recruiting event at IU, it's the first one I'd ever done. None of the previous coaches did one. We, we decided to do one for a game in Indy and another for an East Coast event. We played out in New York. We did the Indy one first. We had over 50 kids show up. It was awesome. The next week in Iona, one player showed up. Right? Like, don't regret doing it. And if that one kid goes to IU, probably not worth it. And even if he doesn't, it's still worth it because we took a shot at something, and yeah, it fell through, but what did that so, take, like you said, take your chances, see what happens. Uh, the, the one thing that, uh, that always sticks in the back of my mind the first thing I'm doing, uh, is actually starting from Ben Ryan, that uh, the standard you want to is the standard you can come. Uh, that's, that's always in my mind of I have to hold myself to, to the same standards I expect to hold around me to, to hold up to. Uh, and uh, it's, it's kind of like part of the different way of saying what these guys that are doing, which is you know, you've got to be part of it, just like you were saying. It's like you're, you're part of that team, you're not the, the head of that team, you're not the leader of that team, you're part of the team. Uh, so my background is in psychology, and I have a, a master's in positive psychology. Psych. So this isn't so much an advice, but more kind of the crux of a program I was a part of, um, an academic program, um, which is really understanding that leadership is really about compassion. And perhaps, as a coach, deep in being able to lead with compassion. And that means understanding that at their core, there are no lazy athletes, right? There's no bad kids. There's no you know, everyone is operating at their best, right, at every moment. And if we meet them with compassion, we're able to bring more out of them. Um, you know, I, I think um, as a coach, like, it's really challenging, right? There's so many other things um, coming into our sphere. Uh, but understanding that, that leading with compassion is, um, you know, something that will keep people coming back to your program. And it's really a non-negotiable. And in terms of advice, um, you know, I did not, or I learned this through trial and error, but as a coach, every single coach, if you don't have a therapist, you know what? And I, that's not a joke, right? I, I mean it. Because if you're not working on yourself, you are not serving your athletes, right? So you need to be deeply, as an individual, finding, can I leave with compassion? And the only way to do that is to do your own work. We're talking about creating an inclusive community. You can't do that if you don't analyze your biases, right? So, I mean, the best piece of advice I ever got was someone told me to go see a therapist. And I'm a much better coach. That's it. Probably comes from a military time. I spent 13 years doing uh, counter narcotics and counter terrorism in the United States Coast Guard. And one of my supervisors early in my day said, uh, we used to have to get things signed off to advance and to get qualifications. And he said, Snacks, you know, remember, you don't just wear your name tag, you wear mine. And you wear the name The name tag of everybody. You know, after, like, they were, they're all, uh, you all have a piece of that support network that pushes you, right? You represent everybody who, who, who's ever helped you along the way. So, like, do right by them. You know, respect that relationship. Respect the journey. When it's your turn, free to give your hand to What? Wow. 
what I tell my players all the time is to be gentlemen on and off the rugby pitch. Uh, I think at the end of the day, we're just all us coaches are trying to build better people uh, to go in the workforce, to be fathers, mothers, whatever it is, um, or whatever their path is. So I tell my players, like, be a gentleman on, off, on and off the rugby pitch. And I'm a professor at my university, too, and really connected with the professors, and they tell me all the time, your players sit in the front row, they push in their chairs. Uh, in today's world, they're wearing masks, and they're just on a small campus like my school. Uh, my guys are always saying please and thank you, and word spreads around. So just constantly remind them, be gentlemen on and off the rugby pitch. Just gives our program a good look and pretty respected by the university. Um, so it's just just simple quote like that. And in the game too, um, you know, I don't want my players to, to chirp or anything like that. I'll talk back to the officials. So jump, gentlemen on the rugby pitch. Let's say I'm always uh, always open to change. You know, I go last weekend I was at the Great Lakes All Stars. Everybody's got their own ways of doing things. We all do the same stuff, right? Some people just do a little bit different. You never know. Always be able to change. More like that last time. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. Yeah. 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 Yeah.